And yeah, and so let's dig into this specifically with a portfolio company that you recently invested in, Jasper. So Jasper AI um, is this also extremely fast growing consumer application of generative AI. And uh, so tell us more about it. And specifically, if you could tell us more about how RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback, allows these consumer products, these user interfaces, to be so intuitive and useful to users. Yeah, so just a little bit of background on Jasper as a product, as a company. So when you look at the founding team of Jasper and the CEO, Dave, was very focused on this idea that a content marketer should have better tools in their hands. And that was the first and foremost problem to solve. Notice I didn't mention anything about AI yet, right? <laughs> it was the idea that a content marketer should have better tools to be able to do their work, to better tools to be able to publish that blog, to be able to write just highly optimized SEO content. And it turns out as Jasper continued their journey, what they realized was that when you introduce a generative model, in this case, they use OpenAI's um, at that point, GPT-3, and then subsequently now expanded the capabilities beyond just OpenAI, but when you use the generative model and you introduce that model alongside of the workflow in UX that was really targeted and tailored to the content writer, you can 10x that experience. And when you mention the idea of a consumer product, it actually turns out it's a special kind of consumer product. It's a prosumer product. And why I say that is that just like you and I would pay for, say, for instance, our own cell phones, regardless of whether our companies would pay for it, the same thing happened with the content writers that were using Jasper. They didn't even want their companies to pay for it. This was just a natural extension of how they live and work. And so this is what I sense is like a prosumer product that sits in between a lot of enterprises. Prosumer. So that's like the idea of professional consumer. Where Correct. It, yeah. yeah, absolutely. A professional consumer that has tools that they would need to use on a day in, day out basis. And how do you really encourage the use of those tools? It was something that I was actually quite familiar with in the last generation of data analytics companies, because if you think about where the dominance of Tableau and Alteryx in particular went in the call it prosumer market of data analysts and data scientists, turns out this became essential tooling for them, right? In a similar way, I almost view there's opportunities for every persona that surrounds a enterprise as well as a prosumer experience of software that's very targeted. In this case, I almost noticed as we started to you know, work with the Jasper team and just understand the use cases and how they sort of solve for the productivity of the, the, the content writer themselves, it was like a mech suit, John. It was like a 10x mech suit of how they can get their work done. Mm -hmm. And when you can do those 10x moments, right, in terms of how people work, that changes you know, the way software is consumed. And in this case, Jasper became one of the fastest growing software companies in the history of SaaS. Yeah, it's wild. Uh, can you give us some of the hard numbers? Um, well, it's still privately held, so, right, right. so I can't give the hard numbers, but I will say that it's uh, near uh, triple digit millions in terms of where the scale of their recurring revenue is. And uh, the opportunity for Jasper coming into market is a little less than two years old. Right. So in two years, <laughs> approaching nine-figure ARR, that is, yeah, that's really, really, really wild. Um, giving OpenAI a run for their money. Um, yeah, and, and interestingly, it was a company that, at least initially, started as one of the first use cases of applied generative AI on top of OpenAI's LM, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And now it's, of course, sort of expanded some of the capability of where it sources some of the large language models. But it certainly tells you a lot about what the opportunity looks like, not only for the build out of the foundation model, but the application layers that are on top of it. Mm -hmm. And then the going back to this RLHF idea, which we haven't really explained to listeners, but um, by having this application now running for two years, Jasper can gather feedback from users and they can fine tune their models to be 
better for this particular use case for content marketing. Yeah, it's it's this is an area reinforcement learning with a human feedback loop, John, that I've been looking at quite a bit in just about any business that started in the generative AI space and probably likely any business that'll come on a go forward basis. And the reason is if you look at where Jasper really progressed, it was the fact that it used the OpenAI model, and to your point, as the content was being written, the quality of the content that was being generated, the iteration of that content and how it was being used, that was the feedback loop to be able to improve model performance over time. And so that reinforcement learning in this case with a human feedback loop was quite important for Jasper in this case to continue to improve the user experience and the attractiveness of how a content writer would work on a day in day out basis. If we even just zoom out from beyond Jasper itself and we look at like what happened with uh, their introduction of GPT-4 into market, well, it turns out, as some of us now well know, the output that came out of ChatGPT, aka GPT-3.5, those were the precise outputs that tune the model performance from exactly that moment of getting a strong RLHF signal back in to the delivery of GPT-4. So what I look at now is does that feedback loop exist alongside of access to some source of private data that can be uniquely differentiated? And so as an investor, as a builder who thinks about this space quite deeply, I don't think it's possible to have long-term sustainable advantages in any software domain without having that private data with some reinforcement feedback loop. And it might be fully human, it might be machine driven, or it might be a combination of human and machine driven feedback mm -hmm, loops. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it creates what investors often call the defensible moat. Right? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's a, it's a <laughs> little bit of an overused term in the <laughs> investor community, what is your moat, right? But yeah. in this case, um, it's very, very difficult for you to build a sustainable business inside of a generative AI context. And if we imagine that generative AI has an impact on all of software, it really means like a sustainable business inside of all of software without having some understanding of what your private data is mm -hmm. and the reinforcement learning surrounding that private data. Mm -hmm. I think particularly with how quickly these AI innovations move, if you don't have some data strategy like you're describing that allows you to have this um, proprietary capability that other people can't have, you're at risk of being gobbled up by something like, you know, GPT-5 could come along uh, in the future and have these kind of generalized capabilities that eat into your specific niche. It's a, it's a fascinating point that you just made, right? Because if we think about anyone who is built on top of GPT-3 and the GPT-3 style of models of its time frame, they you know, were able to build some pretty interesting businesses um, as we indicated some examples. Well, it turns out when 3.5 and certainly 4 emerge, it's almost like you have to throw that out and right. rebuild on top of 4. Right. And why is that? Because the generalized model is in the case of this next generation of four is better than any domain specified right. model that was built in three. Right. And to your point, it is likely gonna play out again in the emergence of the GPT-5 style of models, which you know it's not just OpenAI, but others that are working on it, Anthropico mm -hmm. here and others mm -hmm. that are working on it, um, their respective models, those will likely be fundamentally better as generalized models than what's coming in the current finely tuned domain of you know, what will emerge with GPT-4 style models today. So I think that part of this experience of being a founder in the space right now is you have to be willing to change and almost sort of remove all of the preconceived notions of what worked and reimagine yourself again um, in this next iteration. Yeah. Some of this will slow down. Some of this will, the innovation will start to slow. One of the things that I've talked about in the past is where is this innovation going to slow a little bit more? Well, it turns out that in every iteration of these large language models that are you know, now tokenizing a fair degree of data and now you know, building, say, for instance, a trillion parameter large language model, as you get to call it 
the next exponential scale, somewhere between 10 to 25 trillion parameters in a large language model, you're actually running out of um, what we think of as human knowledge, the human corpus of publicly available data. So over time, you're still going to have to rely on private sources of data, the reinforcement learning on a superpower model that mm -hmm. comes off the shelf from you know somewhere in the range of you know right now a trillion parameters and certainly moving to an order of magnitude greater and that in a lot of ways i think is tremendously exciting for human civilization yeah right? because we have this moment here where this model that has emerged with with particular gpt4 has the sum of a fair amount of our own knowledge encapsulated into it mm -hmm. and it's a co-pilot to our lives and it's only getting better yeah yeah it's wild um and just thinking about ways that people can be so you're talking about how founders like a company of jasper needs to be really aware of how these big ai models the next generation like you're saying anthropic cohere open ai the the gpt5 generation of models that comes forward how they could be able to eat into specific niches like Jasper has um, with uh, content marketing. Um, I know that something that's important to you when you think about your investment decisions is the user interface. So it isn't just about the models in the back end, it's also about creating a user interface, a user experience that is outstanding. And so that it means that you know, somebody that probably buys you a bit of time to figure out how to catch up with the models on the back end. Because somebody, say, who's using Jasper for content marketing, they're going to, they probably love the experience of doing that so much that when GPT-5 comes out, they're not like, oh, I should think about redoing, like just leaving Jasper and trying to do this with GPT-5 because they, there's so much value add just in the experience that they have of Jasper. That's right. And that's one of the reasons why I mentioned that even as models continue to evolve, and they will continue to evolve, there's still bringing that model together with the private data surrounding the reinforcement learning that'll improve the model over time and workflow and UX that supports the user experience in terms of how sticky they are to your product, right? Because the models are pretty solid even today. And as you start to see this evolution of you know, improvements in models, which will certainly drive a lot of um, competition in the space, I'm also seeing you know, the fact that like, the stickiness of like, users you know, continuing to work with a product, it's about the awareness, it's about the user experience, it's about the compelling workflow that plugs into the rest of their lives. And those things are as important as you know, the model fidelity improving over time. It's mm -hmm. not like you can kind of choose one over the other. Like you still have to have fundamentally great user experiences around software. It just so happens now you're doing it in a world where model evolution is at the sort of frenetic pace we're, we're in right now.